طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد بن عبد الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him Every Monday is a reminder of the messenger of Allah Every Monday is a reminder of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, the Prophet ﷺ spoke of Monday to be the day that he was born, the day that he died. ﷺ. We also know that this is the day that he migrated and that many great moments in the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah ﷺ took place in fact on Monday. We ask Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to allow these Mondays to be an opportunity for us to reconnect with the legacy of Sayyid Al-Anam Rasulullah ﷺ. In the first session, can't do this where every session we do a full recap on all the previous sessions. But in the first session we talked about the uh, importance of studying the seerah. And we highlighted particularly the fact that his life is an indication of what we ought to strive to make our lives look like. And every part of who he is, is healing, medicinal, rectifying to every part of who we are. And that's why the, the uh, ulama, rahmatullah al jami'ah, they say it is, in, it is of benefit to the believer to include a little bit of their of seerah in their life every day. Imagine just every day of your life to spend some time with the seerah. When it is explained like, okay, by the, by, the, by the 25th time you visit the Battle of Badr, by the 30th time that you're visiting the hijrah, all of these moments that we've experienced again and again and again as we study them, what becomes the point? And the reality is that our ummah and what makes... See, we are not... We, we refer to talab ilm as, as knowledge seeking, not information gathering. Information gathering is this concept of wanting to just data collection in a sense. But talab ilm highlights the word ilm. And to us... That which is truly ilm is that which leads to have khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah Jalla Jalalu, He tells us in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Indicating to us that the true representation of connection with Allah and fear with Allah is found in the people of ilm. So when we visit the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, our intention is not information gathering, it's not a historical synopsis, it is in fact to gain ilm. And many people have knowledge, many people have information but lack knowledge. And other people may have a lack of information but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an abundance of knowledge. Because at the end of the day, the ability to truly understand things, which is what Imam Ibn Ata'illah rahimahullah ta'ala refers to as fahm, like true fahm. True fahm is mawhiba min mawahibillah. True ability to understand and comprehend things is a giving of Allah that He gives to man yakhtassu min ibadih, whoever He chooses. And yet, one of the things that we can do is exposing ourselves to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is something that then leads us to do this further. So all of this to say, we highlighted in the first session the importance of spending time with the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, not for the sake of information gathering, but rather for the sake of knowledge seeking. And knowledge seeking is something that is internal and is something that is revolutionary and reviving to the soul. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those people. In the second session we talked about I believe it was like the landscape of Arabia and we drew parallels between the landscape of Arabia and the landscape of our time and of course uh, we, we highlighted the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is a timeless prophet for every time and every place and every people and that is the nature of Rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and we talked about that extensively in the third session we talked about the blessed uh, birth of the Prophet ﷺ. And we talked about, in fact, that there were 
uh, indications uh, that led, that, that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing us to get some insight into the fact that something extraordinary was taking place because someone completely extraordinary was coming to change the reality of our world, the coming of the final and last messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We talked about his birth uh, with some level uh, of detail. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in our last session, we spoke about the childhood, the early childhood of the Prophet, والسلام, we spoke about his time with, um, of course, with his mother, with, with Amina. We talked about him growing up as an orphan. We talked about his time with uh, Halima, uh, and we talked about the fact of the influence or the barakah of the Prophet. والسلام, and we, in fact, indicated that if we feel that the barakah that, that Halima ta'ala felt from the Prophet والسلام, was impressive, all of that was before Nubuwa. All of that was before the Risala. And so if that was his barakah before the Risala, imagine what his barakah is after the Risala. And notice we said what his barakah is after the Risala. Because as we mentioned, the barakah of the Prophet والسلام, is not contingent on his life. The barakah of the Prophet والسلام, is accessible through his sunnah, through knowing his sunnah, through loving his sunnah and through following his sunnah. And so all of us have accessibility to the barakah of the Prophet ﷺ. What is one of the best ways that we uh, increase in barakah of the Prophet ﷺ? Of course, by increasing in salawat upon the Prophet uh, ﷺ. Even if you were to just spend every hour, you dedicate 10 minutes of every hour to do salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. You would, you would find yourself yearning for more. You would find yourself yearning for more because after some time, it will become evident to you the athar of the salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Then we spoke about briefly about the death of Amina, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ. And of course, we mentioned that Ummu Ayman, she brought him back, and this is where we last stopped off, which is that she brought him back to the door of, of Abdul Muttalib. And one of the things that we were highlighting is the reality is that at no point of time did Allah Jalla Jalalu leave the Prophet وسلم, without designating and delegating a guardian for him. At every point of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had there be a guardian for the Messenger of Allah. وسلم. And subhanAllah, one of our mashayikh, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentioned. This is how Allah takes care of the orphans. This is how Allah Ta'ala takes care of the orphans. The example is in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it is the specific care that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showcases to the orphans that at every given time, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala places them in the care of someone to be their, their custodian or, 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 or their caretaker or their guardian rather. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam he specifically encourages us to be a, a, a community that prioritizes the orphans. And we talked a little bit uh, last time in our last session, Hafizakumullah, about the idea of adoption in Islam. And that we have this stigmatized relationship with the concept of adoption because of a misunderstanding that we have of the fiqhi implications of adoption. When in reality, the Prophet ﷺ highlights to us that one of the best things that you can do in your life is to do what? Is to adopt. To bring someone in your life that has no father or has no mother or is missing both and is going through a difficult situation and you bring them into your life. And we have both young brothers and sisters here and older brothers and sisters and I think it is a good sunnah for us to bring into our community that every individual make the niyyah to make some form of adoption. Even if it is financial adoption, or if it is full adoption, or if it is a shared adoption, something of that sort is, is highly recommended. And the proof is in the pudding, the sunnah, the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. How many people did the Prophet ﷺ enter into his life? Many. Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, many others came into the household of the Prophet ﷺ, and there was no differentiation between them and the children of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of love, in terms of admiration, and in terms of care. 
and even there's other examples even in the in the Madani time. So the Prophet ﷺ was always under the care, and this is a um, a comfort that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ, that ultimately when the parents are removed from the equation, Allah Jalla Jalalu, He places people to be the uh, the uh, the caretakers and the guardians of the orphans. And as we sit here right now, if you sit in complete silence with your heart, you will be able to hear the cries of the orphans of Gaza. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His most blessed of names and attributes that He comforts the hearts of the orphans and that He dries the tears of the widows. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy the oppressor. We beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see with them the amazing nature of His might and power. And we beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give houses to the homeless. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give food to the hungry, to quench the thirst of those who need it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows us to be a source of aid and relief for our brothers and sisters, both in Gaza and across the world. And yet they are orphans, just like the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was an orphan. He came into the household of Abdul Muttalib. And when he came into the household of Abdul Muttalib, it was a very interesting situation because Abdul Muttalib already had many children who were of various ages. For example, he had Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was not uh, significantly older than the Prophet And so uh, he, was, he was in that house, but it was known that he was a, the, the, the most special of grandchildren, the son, the, the, the son of the most special of children, yani the VIP of the VIP. And those who are parents here, you know, and those who are children sometimes know in the most bitter of ways, that there is always a favorite child. Even if it's not said out loud, everyone has a favorite child under the table, right? Now imagine it became so apparent that you have your favorite child and then you have the child of your favorite child and he was under the care of, of Abdul Muttalib and so he was getting extra, extra, extra love. And that's why we always say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave anyone empty handed. So he was in this home for a very short period of time as we know it was according to most of the scholars it was around two years in fact that he was in the situation yet there are some things that are recorded that are unique that helped again they're part of the development of the Prophet ﷺ and development of the people of Mecca and development of Arabia that this man Muhammad ﷺ would become one of the most remarkable individuals in the history of Arabia and little did they know of the world. And amongst that is that Abdul Muttalib did not allow the Messenger of Allah ﷺ to just like live like a normal kid. He took him every single day to the majlis of the chieftains of Quraysh, the leaders of Quraysh, and the Prophet ﷺ would sit there and observe. You know, visiting tribes would come, Abdul Muttalib would introduce the leaders of Mecca, and he would introduce Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Uh, the leaders of Quraysh would deliberate on things and there is an eight-year-old child amongst them. Sometimes they would get bothered. They're like, we have children too. Why do you get to bring your child to work every day and we don't get to bring our children to work? We have serious things, sensitive issues of safety and security to talk about why is he allowed to be here? And, 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 um, and, and every single time, Abdul Muttalib would say the same statement. This is not a normal child. The matter of this boy is something great. Sha'nuhu azim. That he has something great coming forward with him. To the extent that it was known that when Abdul Muttalib would leave, he will tell Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to sit in the place of Abdul Muttalib and he was the chief of all the chiefs. And so you have this eight-year-old child who's sitting as literally the chief of all chiefs in their majlis and they're looking at him like, who are you and why are you here? And this is again the, the rif'ah, the elevation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, gave to the Prophet sallallahu before his bulugh, before his bi'tha, before his nubuwa, before the coming of, of, of the, the wahi, before anything of that nature, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preparing the world and preparing Arabia to, uh, to welcome in the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And that's why in our communities, we don't want cultural stigma to, pre to prevent potential growth. And what I mean by that is that 
يعني clearly Abdul Muttalib was doing things that are against the norms of that society but for good reason and that's why if we see young people who have uh, who have skills and talents and gifts that we don't belittle them and we say it's just a child it's not a big deal it's 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 nothing worth sitting with rather we follow this tradition we say if we invest in them uh, earlier then the outcome will be greater if we invest in them earlier then the outcome for our world will be will be greater and this is something that we witness with the example of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wasallam and so when uh, abdul muttalib was on his deathbed he looked around and he was debating who he was going to leave Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the care of. Now you just have to imagine, just close your eyes for a second and imagine if he handed him over to the care of Abu Lahab. Imagine what that would have been like. But the wisdom and of course the qadr and the qada of Rabbil Ibad is that he left him in the care of 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 course none other than Abu Talib. And this is important to recognize because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges us in life for the sake of our own betterment and growth and, and out of his lutf and rahmah. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives us amida. Allah gives us pillars of support. The, the challenge that we do is sometimes we have definitive conclusions as to what the pillars of Allah's ta'eed or nasr or madad is. When in reality the humble believer is the one who knows that al nasr min rabbil ibad and al madad al ilahi is something that comes in all shapes and forms and typically the greatest sign of the azama or the jalal of this ta'yid or this nasr is that it is in the most unexpected and unanticipated of places because that's the that's the uh, that's that's an indication of the of of the azama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he places it in an area where it is stripped away of its dunyawi matters and instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places it in the most unexpected of places and so uh, this is an example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving, uh, giving assistance to, uh, to the Prophet through his uncle Abu Talib why would you assume that Abu Talib would not be the most fitting uh, as, as some people would, 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 are, were, are kind of intrigued as to why Abu Talib based off of his discretion, gave the Prophet ﷺ to Abu Talib as opposed to giving him from Abdul Muttalib to, for example, Abu Lahab. Because there's some factors that are known about Abu Talib. Was Abu Talib someone known to be particularly wealthy? Not at all. He was not known for, his, for, for being financially uh, prosperous in that sense of wealth. Uh, was he known as an individual uh, that, that lacked responsibility or had very few children? Quite the opposite. He was known to have a lot of children, a lot of responsibility, a lot of uh, demands from the community. And so for all intents and purposes, you would imagine that he is not befitting. And sometimes we see things and it feels like this is not the best thing for me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that which we do not know and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice for us is best. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed him uh, through Abdul Muttalib in the care of Abu Talib at the age of eight years old when the grandfather of uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi passed away. And he remained, subhanAllah, in the care of Abu Talib until he was four years old. And this is to, to debunk, to completely debunk the Western myth uh, that you are in the care of your parents until you're 18 years old. Now, this does not mean that you live in your parents' basement until you're 40, but, but we, we, that is not the intention at all. What that means is that in our tradition, in the Islamic tradition, you being under the care of your parents does not uh, imply that you are in the financial care of your parents. Financial care is only one, one dimension of care. In fact, in our tradition, once a person is baligh and once a person has a financial income, they are no longer under the financial responsibility of their parents. But when we say he was under the care of his uncle, it means that he was living under the supervision of the wisdom, the knowledge, the love, and the guidance of his uncle. And so that is something that the Qur'an indicates to us that you remain in that state with your parents until you're 40 years old. This is like a, a, a prophetic model that we have 
And of course, uh, the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, he exemplified this uh, to us fully. And so we're wanting to expand what it means for you to be in the care of your parents. And it also is important to know that in our tradition, you being under the care of your parents min nahiya, does not negate that they are under your care min nahiya tin ukhra, from another perspective. For example, you can be under your parents' care in your Qur'an, in your, in your, in your food, in, in maybe even living in their house. But it doesn't mean that you cannot be responsible for them in, or, in, in organizing their medical appointments, in helping them make their travel arrangements, in taking care of other elements of their life, and making sure that they're, you know, that they're taken care of at home and they're, that they're not overstraining their bodies. These are ways where you are caring for your parents and they are caring for you. And so this is a concept that I thought to be important when we highlight that the Prophet ﷺ was under the direct care and supervision and oversight of Abu Talib. Uh, at, at least we can say until, uh, until uh, uh, prophethood in a sense. And even beyond that, we know uh, that, that he uh, remained with that type of involvement. Umm Ayman, she narrates to us something very interesting, which is that it is known, yani through a, yani thousands of years, that the natural disposition of an orphan is that an orphan is very needy. Because of the, yani there's, there's a naqs, they're missing their father, they're missing their mother. I remember, I've mentioned, I think here before, when we went to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, Rehaniya, the border of Turkey and Syria, and we saw, we saw orphans, yani they, they would introduce themselves as Ana ibn shahid fulan. They, would, that, that, yani they don't even tell us their name. They, they identify as the, as the children of martyrs. And subhanAllah, yani you're with them for an hour and two, and because of how much of a void of a mother and father they have in their life, Within 20 minutes, half an hour of being with them, they ask you to become their dad. They ask you to become their mother. They ask you, يعني, يعني one of the kids, he says, Like, just take me home with you. Like, these are, are, are orphans who the natural يعني, inclination or response to being an orphan is what? Is that you have a major void, and so because of that, they become very needy. Yet because of, the, uh, because of the perfection of the character of the Prophet and because of the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the perfection of his dignity of the Prophet this was a trait that was never known of him. In fact, he was known to be the opposite. That he was very independent He was so independent that in fact people depended on him even when he was young. And that's why we see that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi very young, uh, nine years old, ten years old, he became a shepherd. Because he was a very independent individual to the extent that people said, instead of him being a very needy orphan who has all of this loss that needs to be made up and compensated for, uh, rather it is that the Prophet sallallahu was so fully independent that people began to give him responsibilities. And it was said that he was one of the most popular shepherds of Mecca. He knew where to go. He knew how to do it right. The sheep co cooperated with him. And, 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 and uh, he, he knew how to manage them. And that's why, uh, and, uh, and, and that's why one of the, uh, there's a poem by one of the, uh, the scholars in Urdu. He says, we are the sheep of the greatest shepherd. And what an honor it is for us to be the sheep of the greatest shepherd. And if you find that to be insulting, then, then you don't know who your shepherd is. And yet all of us are ultimately the followers. Right? Of course, one of the Sahaba, Allah Ta'ala, he says, we eat how he ate when he ate, and we use the washroom how he did, and there's little in life we find honor in greater than that. This is something that we find honor in. And so the Prophet ﷺ, instead of being needy, as we mentioned, he became extremely... Uh, uh, independent to the extent that people were relying upon him. His uncle was in such a predicament with his own kids that he began to delegate responsibilities onto uh, the Messenger of Allah. And this was something that, uh, that uh, was very clear that he would uh, even include him in, uh, in business, salawatullahi wa alayhi. And he would make sure that he would even take his mashwara. 
And that's why one of the things that we learn from this is it's never too early to take mashwara. It's never too early to take mashwara from your children, even from your grandchildren, akramakumullah. Sometimes you have a, a very deep insight from them. And I'll give you a personal example, and that's why this thing is never live. Because I love to be able to make this more personal. The other day I was on my way to the mosque foundation for a program there. And, um, and, and uh, my son Abdullah, Allah yahmi, was sitting in the back. And he told me, he said, you know Baba, one day you had no children. And you wanted children very badly. And you asked Allah to give you children and today Allah gave you children. And I was like, salli ala rasulillah ya akhi, just relax. I'm on my way to give a dars. He's eating gummies. He's eating gummies. يعني متسلي مرتاح على آخر. يعني he's living his best life. And then as if his mom gave him a message. Allahu أعلم. يعني إن كان في تدخل في الأمر. If she got involved. He said, and one day you didn't have a wife. And you weren't married. And you wanted to get married so bad. And now you have a wife and she is my mama. Like لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. And then he paused and he said, but I am not married. عن نفسه يعني عن نفسه he's talking about فأنا قلت الله المستعان ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله but it was such a beautiful reminder that we need sometimes that يعني ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى that there's so much need that we had in life that Allah سبحانه وتعالى gave to us so always feel ready to take مشورة and to take نصيحة and to take إرشاد even from the most humble of creations one of one of our teachers used to say, Wallahi, you learn from ants. You learn from ants. Watch an ant gather food. Watch an ant gather food. Watch the, nahla, watch the bee go back to its hive. Wallahi, you will learn some of the, most, uh, in, 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 some of the greatest forms of inspiration and motivation when you watch an ant and when you watch a bee. And I'm not saying that exaggeratively. Fi'lan. This is the reality uh, of it. Uh, and so, and so this is something that Abu Talib, he practiced, that he would get shura, he would get mashwara from, uh, from, uh, from, from the Prophet ﷺ, even when he was very young, uh, 10 years old, ila uh, he, uh, he is doing that. Uh, of course, there is, there is, uh, the, uh, there is a journey uh, that, uh, that is very famous uh, when, it, when it comes to... Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is when the Prophet Sallallahu some yani, traveled to Sham, uh, and he was traveling with his uncle, and this is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had earned a level of, uh, in a sense, qualifications with his uncle. I can leave the business to him, I can delegate responsibility to him. I see my, my nephew being a future uh, uh, businessman and a tradesman, and this is, this is a part of the responsibility that we have is to inculcate in our children and in our grandchildren and our nephews and nieces and siblings, help them to discover their talents and to discover their, 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 their treasures as, we, as we've mentioned before. And so uh, Abu Talib was doing so with the Prophet ﷺ and it is to the extent that uh, of course he was going to travel with him to a far distant land which is to the, to the land of Sham which was considered the business hub of Arabia at that time. As they were traveling, as is known, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from very early on, He was giving signs of prophethood to Ahlul Kitab, specifically to Ahlul Kitab, specifically to the Christians and specifically to the Jews. And this was particularly meant to open the door from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those people of the book to witness the coming of, of a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that was very clear in the example of the Prophet sallallahu when he was young, uh, around 10 years old, some narrations say even he was 12 years old, when the Prophet sallallahu traveled with his uncle to Sham, and of course they came across uh, the caravan, and when they came across the caravan, uh, they ran into uh, the monk. And of course the general trend at that time was that you sit with the monk, you listen to him, he gives you a spiel about God, he prays for you, uh, you compensate him so much, and this was an opportunity for, even like subhanAllah, you just think about it, even the kuffar of Quraysh were going to the monk at that point of time, for in a sense a level of tabarruk, really. They sit with the monk, they listen to him, they give him some money, they eat with him, 
and then uh, he gives them advice, and then they continue on their journey, because perhaps if they spend time doing this, it will bring barakah to their journey. It will bring barakah to their journey. And I highlight this because, haqiqatan uh, today, uh, one of the things that we highlight is that we have this separation of who I am with Allah versus who I am with the dunya. And going to Ahlul Ilm, and going to people of, of, of ibadah and people of wara' is one of the ways that we bring barakah not just to our akhirah, not just we bring uh, raha to our qabr, but even to our dunya, even to our dunya. For example, it was a trend, it's a trend within like Muslim lands and Muslim tradition, that if a person is opening a restaurant, if a person is opening a restaurant, that the first thing that they do is they'll invite, and I'm not asking you so you can do it with me, so please don't do it with me, but the first thing that you do is you invite the imam and a group of people from the masjid, and you ask them to come to the masjid, to, to the restaurant, to make dua, uh, to read some Qur'an, and that this will, inshallah ta'ala, be bidayat khair, that this will be a source of barakah and tawfiq. So this is a trend that exists within Islam, that existed before Islam, even when you buy a house, some of the scholars, some of the ulama, they say you bring an imam and some of the musalli, like some of the people that pray in the masjid, you bring them to the house, they call the adhan, they, uh, they, they, they pray salah in jama'ah in the house. This is something that we're witnessing the kuffar of Quraysh do it when they're traveling, but it is something that we find variations of it within our, within our tradition, and it is valuable that we adhere to those things. Of course, it's important that we do it in a way that's aligns with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. For example, there is a direct hadith that says that uh, one of the Sahaba, he asked the Prophet wasallam to come to his house, to pray in the corner of his house. And he says, oh, Messenger of Allah, I want you to do this so that I can pray where you prayed. So this is an indication of the goodness that we can do from that. So even, even the... Uh, 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 even the... the, uh, uh, the uh, the kuffar of Quraysh engaged in this. Now, one of the things that happened is that, of course, the Prophet ﷺ was coming, and we know the, the narration indicates that he was getting particular protection, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preserving the Prophet of Allah, and there was, in some narrations, it says it was a cloud, in others, it says it was uh, like just a general shade, uh, perhaps that the shade was because of malaika. I mean, there are different variations as to how there was uh, the shade. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this was something that made the monk uh, who's known as Bahira became very, uh, very p uh, peculiar and curious as to what was, what was happening. Uh, and particularly he noticed that what was the Prophet ﷺ? Very independent. So he was withdrawn. He, was not, he did not listen to the monk. The Prophet ﷺ did not listen to the monk. The Prophet ﷺ did not even eat with them. The Prophet ﷺ waited for all the elders to eat. Look at his adab. Look at his adab. He waited for all the elders to eat. And then and only then Abu Talib called the Prophet ﷺ over as a young boy, 10 years old, took some food. And then Abu Talib, uh, uh, the, the, the Prophet ﷺ retreated to where he was, which was away and, and, uh, and, and secluded from them. And he sat down alone and he ate sal salawatullah. And there's many things that we can take from that. One is, Yani that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi from problematic settings. Right? And that's why it's a type of tawfiq. It's a type of tawfiq. When your friends are going to bad places and you don't go to those bad places. Uh, and it is a type of tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he protects you from things that other people fall in. Because it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing a type of sitr. Remember what did we mention in one of the khawatir after Salat al-Isha? We said that a sitr qismain ala qawl al-imam ibn Atayillah rahmatullahi alayhi uh, urdwana he says that there's there's two types of sitr whoever tells me this I'll get you a cookie there's two types of sitr la ahad abadan tawadu' aw jahl tawadu' inshallah nuhsin al-dhan fikum and, and that is that uh, Jahl was a strong choice of words I should have used something lighter uh, So 
that one is when you are protected from falling in the ma'asiyah in the first place. Like many of us, we want sitr. What do we mean when we want sitr? We say when we say, Oh Allah, Allah mustur alayna, that Ya Allah, we've done a lot of bad things. Ya Allah, we don't want people to know the bad things that we've done. Right? We think that this is what sitr is. This is not actual sitr. In fact, Imam Ibn Atala, he says, this is a sitr when your greatest concern is what people think of you. Real sitr is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does sitr of you where he prevents you from falling in the sin in the first place. Because that means that who you care about or what you care about is who you are with Allah, not who you are with the creation. And most of us are more concerned about who we are with the creation than we are of who we are with Allah Jalla Jalalu. We ask Allah Ta'ala for protection uh, from that. And so one of the things is that uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala conceals and protects the Prophet Of course there's the example, I don't know if we mentioned this last time, it's a little bit of a funny example where the Prophet was like, my friend kept inviting me to a party and then I finally said, fine, I'll go to this party. And then I went to this party and my friend was watching the sheep instead of me. And, uh, and, uh, and as soon as I went to this party, I fell asleep. Before even even got started, I fell asleep. And then my friend was, was like, you know, how was the party? So, you know, I kind of slept through the party. He said, no, 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 you have to try again. And so he went to the party the second day. And it was like a space where people may engage. And in, uh, in fact, the narration says that the Prophet ﷺ says, as soon as the music began. And this is one of the uh, uh, proofs that... Uh, that uh, some of those who uh, prohibit music uh, indicate that the Prophet ﷺ was protected from music uh, as an indication of uh, the problematic nature of it. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Uh, regardless, there's benefit to take from it, ala kulli hal. But the Prophet ﷺ fell asleep the second time, and when he woke up, the party was over. Both times he woke up, he's like, Where, where am I? How did I get here? And he, the Prophet ﷺ immediately knew. He said, that, Then I knew that this was. Uh, this, this, this was Allah protecting me. This was Allah Ta'ala protecting me. All of this to highlight sitr. That, that part of it is Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala protected uh, the Prophet Sallallahu from problematic spaces. Ala kulli hal, in all circumstances, one of the things that happened was um, there was an observance that the monk had of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that was to the extent that uh, that, uh, that he was able to recognize that there was a marking on his back. And immediately he said uh, that, uh, that, that, that this, this must be a prophet of Allah, but he didn't want to say it out loud. So he went ahead and he interacted with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And he said to him, uh, he, he asked him, he said, I need to ask you something. And I'm asking you by the Lord of Allah wal Uzza. I'm asking you by the Lord of Allah wal Uzza. And the Prophet ﷺ's response to him was, "Don't ask me by Allah wal Uzza. I don't care about Allah wal Uzza. Ask me by Allah." And uh, and he responded and he said uh, uh, he said he said uh, I ask you by Allah. And he said uh, he said uh, okay, what do you have? Uh, uh, what, what is the seal on you? And do you notice these things that are happening around you? And the Prophet ﷺ remained silent. In one of the narrations, it says that the Prophet ﷺ responded to him and told him, you know, whatever is happening is from uh, the master of the world and I'm under his care the way that all of creation is under his care. But that generous, generally, the monk was like, man, I'm not, yani I'm not satisfied with his answer. I'm not satisfied with his answer. And of course, he then wanted to get more information, so he went to Abu Talib. And Abu Talib had claimed at this point of time that the Messenger of Allah, there's one narration that says that he said that the Messenger of Allah was just a helper, like just a boy that they brought to help. The other narration says that he says that, that, uh, that the boy was his, was his own son. Uh, in, regardless of the case, <laughs> the, immediately the monk is like, something's not adding up. Yani, there's no way that this is the case. And then he said, he said, listen, I'm asking you for the sake of the child and I'm asking you for the wellness of the child. And so he said, um, he said, he's not my son. He's the son of my father. Uh, he's the son of my brother, rather. His father passed away when he was, when he was very young. In any case, uh, uh, he, he had advised them, he had advised them that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ not continue the journey. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that can be extracted from this. Uh, number one is the fact that Ahlul Kitab 
were in fact in full anticipation of a prophet. To the extent that anyone that was practicing from Ahlul Kitab was not just in anticipation, but they were in fact on the lookout for a prophet of Allah. And this tells us that the idea or the claim of Rasulullah وسلم being a prophet was not as out of this world as it was being claimed to be from the kuffar of Quraysh. That this was something that was completely out of pocket, out of this world, because in the Christian circles and in the Jewish circles, there was a level of acknowledgement and recognition that a prophet of Allah was coming. And so this is important to recognize because in our, in our modern days, yani we can compare the kuffar of Quraysh to like the general masses of society. And then you will have the people of the book or people who have some level of religious orientation. And something that our deen highlights is that within the people of the book, there will be people who have a level of khayr in them. And one of the tasks that we have is to meet them in the place of khayr. To meet them in the place of khayr. Because they may be most susceptible to doing ta'awun, of working together, of engaging with one another. This is not a green light to become compromising on, uh, on religious values. Uh, rather, uh, rather, it is a testament to the fact that it is important that we be engaging with the people of the book. My, my statement here to be uh, engaging with the people of the book does not mean that we do interfaith activities that لا, ما لها أي معنى ولا قصد ولا فائدة but instead it is a, a, a highlighting that says we engage with the people of the book in shared interests. What do I mean by shared interests? Someone is trying to open a casino. Someone is trying to open those places where they bet on sports or horse racing or things like that. Someone wants to open a liquor store. And where we disagree with them, we disagree with them. قطعاً لا خلاف في الأمر. But in areas where we can come together on shared principles and values, the prophetic model says that we need to lean into our shared interests and shared values in order to, inshaAllah ta'ala, bring about the greater benefit for humanity, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, and then of course, there's more details of the questioning uh, that the monk uh, uh, made. And part of it is that he uh, questioned what the Prophet did uh, uh, for a living. And when, he was said, when it was said that he was, uh, you know, that this young boy was mostly a shepherd, he said there wasn't a prophet or a messenger except that he came as a shepherd. And then of course he told uh, the uh, Prophet and he specifically told Abu Talib that it is in your interest, in your nephew's interest, and in the interest of all of our people, that you send him back because if he reaches the land of Asham, that great harm uh, will come to him. And so one of the narrations says that, that he went forward a little bit and then there were more signs that he should send him back. And then Abu Talib sent back uh, the Prophet وسلم, And then in the other narration it says that actually immediately Abu Talib took the advice of the monk and he sent him back. And that's why it is important to be able to, to take advice like that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends people our way to give us nasiha, never feel, never feel overconfident of, um, uh, uh, in, in a sense where you're not willing to get warnings. Because even if the person is unqualified to give you nasiha, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humbles us by giving us protection and guidance from people that we may feel lack the qualifications to do so. So you need to have Sa'ad Sadr, like a, a vast enough chest and an open enough heart and a humble enough soul to listen. You can filter, don't get me wrong, you can filter. But if there is legitimacy to what is being said, then similar to Abu Talib, he's meeting the monk for the first time. He's meeting the monk for the first time. And yet he recognized a level of sincerity and genuineness in him. And so he took the the, uh, the uh, nasiha uh, from him. There are some other things that we know about the youth of the Prophet ﷺ, which is that it is known that the Prophet ﷺ never drank alcohol. Not even once did the Prophet ﷺ drink alcohol. Which might seem normal, like some of you might be thinking, hey, me too. I also never drink alcohol. Alhamdulillah. Very proud of you. But in his society, ﷺ, it was very common that it was like particularly for young folks and particularly for young men 
drinking was a, a plague, like quite literally a plague that was uh, afflicting their society. So it was particularly uh, outland, uh, like, uh, like, like uh, abnormal, and, and it was something that was distinguishing to the Prophet ﷺ and a distinct characteristic of his, that he would not drink salawatullahi wa Of course, even one of the things is that, that's unique about the Prophet ﷺ is that there are sometimes in societies that are embedded with, uh, with, uh, with kufr and shirk, there are sometimes subtle things that happen that just become like, uh, like, uh, uh, like social norms. Like one of the social norms is that every time you made tawaf that you would touch a particular idol. You just touch it. يعني, that's it. You just walk around and you just touch, uh, you just touch an idol. And... Um, and the Prophet ﷺ never did that. He, he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam did not touch the idol any time that he made tawaf. To the extent that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Zayd, I believe it was, when he was making tawaf with him, do not touch the idol. Do not touch the idol. And, and so Zayd was like, man, like, he's not touching the idol. He's telling me not to touch the idol. And so... Uh, and so um, and, uh, and so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was, was doing tawaf again. And Zayd was like, you know, like, maybe I should just touch this idol and see what happens. So he went and he touched the idol. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, didn't I tell you, didn't I tell you not to touch the idol? And he said, yeah, but like, I, I didn't see a significant reason. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, do not touch the idol because what we're worshiping is the Lord of the Kaaba, not these idols. And so there was this tawheed. And this, uh, uh, you, you know, oneness of Allah that was embedded within the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam from the first day. Another incident that's unique is even just the the modesty of the Prophet wasalam, that was preserved. And this is an incident that is so interesting that uh, that that it was common that that boys at that time would engage in like activities that were very physically strenuous sometimes to help build things sometimes it was like a part of them like testing their strength you know how like today you go to the gym some people lift 10 some people 50 some people 100 and it's like there's a level of munafasa of how much you can lift the culture at that time was that when people were lifting they were lifting stones like big boulders and in order for them not to trip while they were lifting these 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 boulders they would take off their izar their lower garments and, uh, and, and subhanAllah, uh, yani one time the Prophet ﷺ was engaging with them in removing or the, 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 the moving of these stones. And, uh, and, and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was again going to begin uh, from, from engaging with them in this activity. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, <laughs> yani just, just think about the, the type of protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to, to, like we say to his awliya, imagine the Prophet of Allah. That the Prophet ﷺ is, is ready, he's doing it, and one of the shabab is just like, listen, you're going to trip on your izar, just take off your izar, right? Something so simple. Take off your izar so you don't trip on it while you're carrying these boulders. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, said, I began to take off my izar when I heard a voice from behind me say, tie your izar, and punched me in the back of the head and I fell over. And you look at this, it's like a, a knocking of sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the Prophet ﷺ, his dignity, his modesty being preserved. And these are, again, very small things. So that later on in his life, it could never be said that the Prophet ﷺ was exposed in a way that he shouldn't have been exposed and is unbefitting of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa These are all ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed and protected uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Um, I'm trying to think if there is anything else uh, from, the, uh, from this period of time. I know that we're hitting time. I usually like for us to stop around and now, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, perhaps we can stop here and open it up for, for questions and answers, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll continue uh, uh, moving forward, inshallah ta'ala. We only covered uh, about half of what I intended. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوتَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ but inshallah ta'ala will speed up in the next session. What questions do you all have? Naam. Yeah.
Yes, were you not here last week? Ah, you missed out, man. You missed out. No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, except from you, your intention of being here. Yeah, we talked about that. That happened when the Prophet ﷺ was approximately three years old under the care of Halima. And we spoke about that uh, with some detail. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to make like small clips and uh, we'll put them online, inshallah ta'ala. Good question, though. What other questions do folks have? Naam, akhi. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the, so the narration about Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu is different. So they used to take their lower garment off completely. It's like going to lifetime. You know what I mean? Yeah, Allah yistur alayna jami'an. So it was like that. Whereas yani, with Uthman, like, the awra and the remember the, the, the clothing at the time of, of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was very different. Uh, and, and in fact, it was quite loose. And so garments riding up and skin becoming exposed was something that uh, was very common. To the extent that as long as parts of your body were not completely exposed, as long as it was unintentional, that inshallah ta'ala, it wasn't something that uh, was problematic. And even in salah, there's the issue that people would not have enough clothing where when they made ruku' sometimes it was difficult to make sure that, that, that parts of them were all covered, right? And so that's different, like the, the, the covering that the Prophet ﷺ did for Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu as opposed to the haya that, uh, that the malaika even had for him is, uh, is separate than the type of exposure here where it was like a more uh, kind of uh, broad exposure that was not... Uh, appropriate uh, for the standard of the best of Allah's creation. Salawatullahi wa sallamu alayhi. Good question though. Yes, my brother. We're not going to get into signs of the jail, are we? Right. For sure. And, and I think it's important to know that there's like a transition, right? With like Ahl uh, al-Kitab. And, and, uh, and also important to understand that we don't have conclusivity of who Allah considers to be believers. Uh, let me be clear of what I mean by that. Meaning that Ahl al-Kitab until the Ba'tha of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their categorization with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Like if they were believing in things to the extent of what they had accessibility to, then, then while we can very definitively say what was not Islam and what was not Tawheed, we do not know what they had exposure to and what the conclusion of that is in terms of what their final abode is. Does that make sense? So a, a monk who worshipped and practiced their sharia to the extent of their knowledge, to the best that they knew, yani what their final abode with Allah is something that we, we uh, refrain from commenting on. Wallahu ta'ala. In fact, there are statements that indicate that this monk actually became Muslim. Wallahu ta'ala alam. I didn't, I didn't check the authenticity of those, but I, uh, I remember hearing something of that nature. Yes. Oh, Dr. Asra, I recognize your voice. Yes. Two types of like sitr. Sitr is like the concealing or like the protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... A lot of times when we say, like for example, Allah yustur alayna, like may Allah conceal us or conceal for us. When we say, oh Allah conceal for us or veil for us, what we typically mean by that generally is, Ya Allah, I got a lot of black spots on my heart. I have a lot of shortcomings. Allah, I want people to not know about that. That's what we generally mean when we say, oh Allah conceal or veil for us. Right? 
But uh, Al Imam Ibn Atayla highlights that that is not the full extent of sitr. And he actually highlights that the greatest form of sitr is when Allah veils us enough where we don't fall into the sin in the first place. Veils us and conceals us from falling into the sin in the first place. He says that is the type of sitr that we should really be asking for because that means that what we're most concerned about is who we are with Allah, right? As opposed to being concerned about who creation see us to be. Now, we don't need to be only in one of those. We ultimately want both forms of sitr, right? We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to conceal for us in that He conceals for us from us falling into sin. And we also want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conceal, to conceal for us where our sins do not become public information. Is that, does that make sense? Very good question. Yes, my brother. No, no worries. Mm. Yeah, is that like a question or a statement? Yeah, so like he would sit in like the, there was like this majlis, like the place of, uh, of, uh, of the chieftains where they would meet. And there was a particular like, uh, maybe you can call it like a sofa, uh, that was for uh, uh, Abdul Muttalib, for his grandfather. And the Prophet ﷺ was known to sit there when his uncle was not there, and he was known to nap there while his grandfather was there. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Very good question. Other questions? Naam. It is said that he did, yes. But it, well, like the dynamic had shifted. The dynamic had shifted from like a, a head, head, head honcho, like Abdul Muttalib, to a more divided kind of thing. Uh, whereas Ab, uh, Abu Talib had certain responsibilities, but he was also like particularly uh, held in a position of reverence and respect. No, he, he had, he was definitely considered one of the leaders of all of Quraysh. And that's why even when there were situations that were compromising within Banu Hashim, Banu Hashim couldn't do anything because of his position in Quraysh. And that's why his protection and like the, the, the role of Abu Talib was one that extended beyond just their own tribe. And this is from the hikmah of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Yes, he's his as uh, min al and he's his uncle. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's okay. It's a good question, but yeah, yeah. It's like I mean, once the Fatima Amina situation happened, like I'm on edge. You know, I'm just joking. Nan. Oh, I'm so sorry. He was asking uh, what the relation was of uh, Sayyidina Hamza radiAllahu taala anhu. Uh, with the, the um, with the Prophet and he is his uncle in that he is the brother of Abu Talib, uh, as well as the brother of Abdullah, the uh, the uh, father of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he's also the Prophet akh min al which is like his brother through uh, uh, through uh, through being uh, both of them being nursed by uh, by Sayyidah Halima radiAllahu taala anha. Naam. This is another thing, absolutely. He was the, he was, uh, the only full brother. Uh, and so he had a level of blood tie. That's very good. Allah uh, That he had a type of qaraba to the Prophet والسلام, that gave him awlawiyah, that gave him precedence. Right? Jameel. Very good, mashaAllah. Nam. Yeah, we've covered that too. Yeah, the, the, the dream of the fountain of Zamzam. We're so happy to have you here with us today, alhamdulillah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we covered it. Do you have a specific question about that? Yeah, no, I'll get you the recording, inshallah. Give me your email. We'll say, I just don't like going live. It's just like a thing. Yeah. Um, ala khair, inshallah. Any other questions? 
I like to keep it, I don't, I don't want to go for too long, inshallah, keep it light. We're meeting weekly, alhamdulillah. Uh, I, I promise you next time we will go quicker, inshallah. Uh, although to me, yani the istimbat and the istikhraj is, is, uh, is, is very, very important. And so inshallah ta'ala will try to have tawazun and i'tidal where we're both uh, extracting benefits and lessons and we're also covering uh, from uh, the... Uh, so let me make you a promise from now. Next time we will get through at least the marriage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At least. Till that point, including the marriage, inshallah ta'ala. And, and perhaps even cover uh, some of the children, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyib. وبهذا نختم والله تعالى أعلى وأعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. But in case you thought I forgot, I did not forget. What is the homework that we've been doing? Salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. How many a day now? A hundred. I heard like three different numbers. It's highly problematic. Uh, a hundred a day minimum, and we said try to do it where you do like either some after every salah, maybe some with the morning athkar. A sister told me the other day she does 50 when she wakes up and 50 when she goes to sleep. And you even, you can go uh, on, uh, on, on YouTube and just look up salawat mukarrar, like just repeat it salawat. It's very nice, you can just listen to it and repeat with it. Do not make it where you listen to it and it's just like dead in the, in the don't. Leave that, let that be for, for whatever. Don't, don't be passive listening. You have to be active listening and moving your lips in salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, and so that was one thing. What was another assignment that we gave? Afwan? Do more, so it was more specific than that. What is it? Beautiful. Revive a sunnah that is between you and Allah was one week, and revive a sunnah that is between you and Al Khalq was the last week. Right? One that is between you and Allah, and the other is revive a sunnah that is between you and the creation. Right? Very good, mashaAllah. Now it's become where knowing the homework is an accomplishment. The goal, the goal is doing the homework is, not, is an accomplishment. Fa, yani, I'm not going to assign any homework except that you do these three. Every day, no less than a hundred salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, we ask Allah ta'ala to help us with that. You revive one sunnah for the week that is between you and Allah Jalla Jalalu. And then you revive one sunnah that is between you and the creation. Right? Is that fair? I don't know if there's tea or coffee or cookies. If there is, alhamdulillah. If not, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the cookies and tea of Jannah. And next week, inshallah. So we don't have to wait till Jazakumullah anna khaira. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Looking forward to seeing you all uh, next week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, 